So we I think started with first uh, DCI, double CI, okay. So let us write down the equations first. So now that we know that the method of projection gives the same as the variation method, we are going to use the method of projection to write the equation. We have done that, it is a matrix eigenvalue equation, but I want to rewrite this once more. So H then C naught psi Hartree Fock plus sum over A less than B So we are writing only doubles, so no singles because doubles are the first important terms. So it is a, it is what is called truncated CI, which means I have truncated the CI expansion only to doubles. It is not a full CI, it is not exact even in the m dimensional basis, okay. So then what we do is to project. So first we project with the C no, psi Hartree Fock. So we will get psi Hartree Fock H psi Hartree Fock C0. So that is a number, and then we will get here plus A less than B R less than A psi Hartree Fock H psi ABR. So this will survive. Remember when you did only singles, this was the block which was 0 because of Brillouin's theorem, right. But here this will survive with the C A B R S, okay, plus equal to, or sorry, equal to E naught. Now it is very easy to see here the psi Hartree Fock, psi Hartree Fock is 1. So you have E naught times C0, and this is our orthogonal. So you do not have to write, right? The right hand side, when I project with psi Hartree Fock, you have only coefficient C0 because this is equal to 1. So coefficient comes out. Psi Hartree Fock is orthogonal to psi ABRS, so you do not have to write. So, this is the reason you get a eigenvalue type of equation, okay. Then you have the next set of equation, which is one of the specific doubly excited determinant. Let me call it now psi CDTU. I do not want to use the dummy variable ABRS, so it is one of the doubly excited determinants where AB is equal to CD, RS is same as TU. So psi C D T U is a specific index now, okay. C D T U are specific index. So I do the same exercise. You have H psi Hartree Fock C naught, right? Plus sum over A less than B R less than A psi C D T U H psi A B R S. Okay. So this is basically the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between doubles and doubles as we as we talked yes uh, in the last class the doubles and doubles HDD. So this is that part into the coefficient again you have an energy this part is very easy because when I do psi C D T U this is orthogonal to psi Hartree Fock even this is ortho orthogonal to all psi A B R S unless A B is equal to C D. R s equal to T u, so that time only C C D T u will survive. So you can see whatever is the configuration with which I am projecting, that corresponding coefficient comes on the right hand side. That is all, the right hand side is very simple and that is the reason we call this a matrix eigenvalue equation. So this is H times C, you can see H times C equal to E times C, one of the six. You have actually the set of equations. So if I write this as a matrix problem, then you have the, the first part. 
So, this is a matrix of H where the first part is E Hartree-Fock because this is nothing but E Hartree-Fock, please remember. And then you have a set of numbers which are psi Hartree H psi ABRS and then on the on the column side you have again psi CDTU H psi Hartree-Fock and then you have maybe I push it a little bit further so that it looks nicer. So that is my matrix. So you can see this is for all CDTU, this is written for specific CDTU but you have to keep on changing. So as I change I have all the numbers here, I will have all the numbers here and this, so this is basically one number, this is a, a row, this is a, exactly a conjugate column and this is a square matrix, square matrix between doubles to doubles, okay. And then you have C0 and C A B R S the doubles coefficient equal to E naught the same thing C 0 C A B R S or C C D T U whatever. So you can see that whatever I am multiplying I will have exactly the same number coming up. This A B R S is just a, a generic thing they are all doubles. So in, in a very simple way I can write this as E Hartree-Fock, Psi Hartree-Fock, H Psi doubles. So psi d, I am introducing a psi d just to say it is a block of all doubles, okay. And then you have similarly psi d, h, psi Hartree-Fock and then you have a psi d, h, psi d. Is c0, cd equal to e0, c0, c. okay. Of course, cd is not a one number. CD is a column, okay. So CD is a column. So it is a, it is a let us say n, n number of doubly excited determinants. So it is total n plus 1 dimension in that case. So this is actually a, a set of numbers CD. So similarly this is a, a block, okay. This is a row and this is a, co a corresponding column, okay. So it is a 2 by 2 block, okay. So 2 by 2 block. So that is the reason when you have only singles, then these two blocks become 0 because of Brillouin's theorem and the matrix becomes block diagonal. So you just have this one value E0. So this is the reason we are calling it matrix eigenvalue equation. So I just want to re rewrite. So if you now add singles, doubles, triples, whatever, I can keep on writing very easily by the similar block which I will exp exp explain a little later. So this becomes your double CI equations, okay. So I have to calculate the coefficient and then put it in this equation, I will get the energy. How do I calculate coefficient? From this equation. So the second set of equation will give me the coefficient. If I solve this equation, it is a linear equation, I can put it back here. That is one way to look at it or you can say I simply construct the Hamiltonian and diagonalize. That is one and the same thing, okay. You construct the Hamiltonian and diagonalize, then you will get the E naught and all the coefficient. Of course, if you construct the Hamiltonian and diagonalize, we know that you are not going to get only one E0. You will get the entire dimension. So whatever is the number of total number of elements, you will get that many E0. So this is what leads you to what are called excited states. So all those lower, all those higher energies will now be actually excited states and they also follow the, the uh, theorem that I told, McDonald's separation theorem they are the upper bounds to exact excited states, not just for the ground state, okay. So all those numbers will come. So there are many ways of solving it. So one is to, simplest way to think is to construct the matrix and then diagonalize. However, very often this is a very tedious task because the number of doubly excited determinants, if it is very large, then the matrix becomes very large. And diagonalization of large matrix is very often uh, time consuming. Further, the advantage that I have in diagonalizing is that I get lots of energies, but very often I am not interested in those energies. 
because let us say I am only interested in getting ground state. So, I am doing a lot of work for no reason. So, is there a simple way to solve this the eigenvalue equation without actually diagonalizing the full matrix? So, you have to understand that this matrix size is very, very large and we do not want, if it is 1 million by 1 million matrix, I mean you do not want 1 million eigenvalues, right. And what will you do with 1 million excited state? I mean, that is not interesting to chemistry. We often want ground state and maybe first or second excited state. So, there are better ways of doing it and those are actually called iterative solutions, iterative solutions to this eigenvalue problem which is uh, much better. So, something that I will mention in during the course of the CI problem, if not today, maybe tomorrow, okay. So, there is an iterative solution in which you can at least get one or two roots, ground state and first excited state quite quickly and at a reasonable accuracy, okay. But you do not get all the states. So, you do not have to actually diagonalize this full matrices, okay. So, let me just uh, try to again understand whether you have all, you are all in sync with me. So, essentially you have to construct a matrix of the Hamiltonian in the basis of the determinants which are included in the CI. So, that is the first thing. So, first determinant is psi Hartree-Fock. So, that gives you a number E Hartree-Fock. Then there is a set of numbers, everything is a number of course. There is a set of numbers which is between psi Hartree-Fock and all psi ABRS. Similarly, I have all doubly excited determinant project, project this with psi Hartree-Fock. There is a set of, I call them a column and then between doubles and doubles. So, I have the full matrix which I am looking at as a two block. One is the Hartree-Fock, Hartree-Fock block which is one by one and the rest is all doubles. So, if my doubles number is n, then what is the dimension of the matrix? n plus 1. Is it clear? Because Hartree-Fock you have to add. So, my total number is Hartree-Fock plus all doubles. So, if I give you some small problem, you should be able to calculate at least the dimension of the matrix. I give you a small basis, two basis problem. You should be able to calculate how many doubly excited. If in a DCI, you should be able to find the dimension of this problem and, and should be able to write it as a doubles, block of doubles. Is it clear? Uh, before we go forward, let me also mention that we uh, introduce something called intermediate normalization in the perturbation theory. So, you may like to know, is there intermediate normalization here? Can I do this? Clearly, the wave function that I have proposed to you is not intermediately normalized. I hope you can see this. The, in, the, pro the proposition of this is that psi Hartree-Fock, if I do psi Hartree-Fock, and exact psi naught that should be equal to 1 if you remember intermediate normalization. If I do this here, the psi 0 which I now call psi 0 DCI as I have proposed, what is the value? Can somebody tell me? It is not 1, what is the value? As I have proposed the DCI wave function, what is the value of that? C0 plus anything is there? Can there be anything because it is orthogonal? So, only C0, right? Only C0 and I have no control over C0 because C0 will come out of the solution. I have no control over C0 except that I know that C0 must be very large, very large because in the exact wave function Hartree-Fock is a dominating term. C0 must be close to 1 and of course, C0 square plus all coefficient a less than b r less than s c a b r s square or mod square equal to 1. You can call this mod square, right? That is a normal normalization, okay? But obviously, this is the most dominating term and these are very, very small. Typically, typically when you do a CI, this C naught may be 0 0.95, 96, 97. So, you can imagine that large. So, it is very, very large. In, uh, the Hartree-Fock itself is very large. The probability of Hartree-Fock would be easily about 90 percent or more. And then all the rest contribute to the last 10 percent. So, you have to understand that these values are very, very small because you have already said Hartree-Fock is a very good wave function except that we cannot be satisfied with that because of chemical accuracy that we want for the properties, for the uh, difference energies. 
So we still have to take those small, small quantities as accurately as possible. So this is the thing that we get and clearly this is not an intermediate normalization because for intermediate normalization, you must have C0 equal to 1. So the question is, can I introduce intermediate normalization in CI? So if you look at the problem, then you will realize that this can be trivially done. Simply set C0 equal to 1. So I set C0 equal to 1. So if I write DCI in intermediate normalization, okay, then what will happen is that this wave function will not have C0. So that is one. The rest will remain as it is. So the C0 will go, this will go, this will go, this will go, correct? So it is absolutely trivial to write it. Everything is same and your equation here will be exactly same except that this will be 1. Okay. So everywhere I can put C0 equal to 1. And immediately you can see that your wave function is now intermediately normalized, okay, because C0, but well obviously you know by previous discussion that if that is so, if C0 equal to 1, then of course psi0, psi0 cannot be 1, right, because psi0, psi0 is nothing but mod C0 square plus this quantity, this is already 1, so obviously this will be greater than 1 because these coefficients have to survive. Otherwise, of course, you are doing nothing. So they are non-zero survive. So this will be obviously greater than one. And that is something that we have to accept. And I can always renormalize later to get back C0. If I renormalize, then I will get back 1 by square root n. That will be my C0. So this is very easy to do. I hope you realize that this is really not a problem. Often we want to write it in this manner only because the perturbation theory you have done with the intermediate normalization. So we like to compare with the perturbation theory. So in this case, it is easy to put the DCI equation in the in the intermediately normalized form. Yeah, any questions? No. You want to ask anything? Yes, you do not need to do, as I said, you do not need to do, but uh, it is convenient. The convenience is the following that you will immediately see because I want to calculate the difference of E0 and E hot form as a correlation energy. That comes out easily, otherwise there is a C0 which gets stuck here with E hot as I showed you. It becomes E hot times C0, I will come to that. So that becomes very easy to look at the correlation energy, but you do not need to do, yeah, you are right. I can still divide by C0 and do it, it is not a, it's not a big problem. And comparison with the MP2 and all that that I have done becomes more easy. But so I just want to tell you the intermediate normalization is not a new theory. Of course, it is the same DCI. I have forced this equal to 1 and obviously this coefficients will change because I have forced C0 equal to 1, so everything will get normalized. Everything will get renormalized. Okay. So let us look at the equation in intermediate normalized. So I have finally this block. So let me go back, let us see how the iterative solution will look like in intermediately normalized form. So essentially I am going to look at this. So the first term is E hot report. So what I am going to do, I am going to multiply the first row times the first column, okay. So E hot report, this is a set of numbers which, which is a row, okay, which is a row. Let me call it B dagger. We will see why I am calling it dagger. B dagger multiplied by CD. So this becomes B dagger C or CD. Please remember I am now using a matrix notation. B dagger is a row. So B is a column. So this will be my B. This is B dagger. It is a B dagger times this column. Is it clear to everybody? I mean, I am just using a matrix. So this is a matrix. This is not a number. This is a matrix. Obviously, this has to be a set of numbers. So it is a row. This is a column. It is a one, one dimensional matrices actually, B dagger C D equal to E naught. So first row into first column equal to E naught. And you can quite clearly now why I use C naught, why I put C naught equal to 1 
because you can clearly identify the correlation energy as this, right? I do not have to divide by C naught later, okay? So that is easy. So whatever is the B dagger and C D, C D is the set of coefficients, doubly excited coefficient. B dagger is this matrix element where Hartree-Fock is on the left, Psi D on the right. And obviously it is a set of numbers, set of Psi D. So all this together becomes a column index, column index, a row index. So this is basically, this is B dagger, let us say, this is some B dagger and this is some column. CD. So, this is my B dagger, this is my CD. So, you just multiply this, you will get one number. If you multiply row times column, you get one number. So, that is what you will get because I need a number here. These are all numbers, correct? By dimension, you can see that. Then I go to the second equation. The second equation, I have CD. So, sorry, I have B. Note that if this is B dagger, this must be B, right? So B into 1, so B, again this is a column, it is not just a number, B into 1 plus you have now a set of block which is a matrix now, D, let me call it D. I put 2 bar to denote that this is a 2 dimensional array, it is a matrix. Why it is 2 dimensional? Because you have a set of numbers here, you have a set of numbers here, right? So it is a 2D matrix, is it clear? One side is ABRS, another side some CDT. So all doubles with all doubles. So one row will be one doubles. So basically I am looking at this, these elements, all elements. So one row will be defined by CDT, one column will be defined by ABRS. So I am calling it a 2D matrix. It is really a matrix, square matrix. Of course it is a square matrix, right? This should be multiplied by what? CD, it is a column. This is a column. Now you see, look at the dimension of the problem. It is exactly the same. This is a column. This matrix times column, column is also a column and you will get a column on the right side because it is E0 times CD. So everything is beautiful. That means this column, this is a column thing. So it is actually a set of equations. If I want to write, it is a set of equations. I have written in one equation. It is actually a set of equations. Bi, plus D i j C D j equal to E naught C D j. It is a set of equations, but I am writing only one, one equation here, right? In a, in a matrix form, I hope all of you are sophisticated enough to write things in matrix form now. By now you are sophisticated, right? <laughs> Mathematically sophisticated, I should say, okay? So and here of course everything is a number. So this is a one dimensional equation. This is the dimension of the equation is number of doubly excited amplitudes here. So I need to calculate this quantity. Remember, what is unknown, what is known? B dagger is known because that is a matrix element. That is Slater rule. I can apply the Slater rule, I can find out. What is not known is the CD, right? CD is in the intermediate normalized form. The coefficients are all that is unknown in the CI. The wave function is otherwise known. So I need to get CD. How do I get CD? I look at the second equation. From the second equation, B is again known, right? B is again known. So from the second equation, I will try to get a form of CD and substitute this here. So matrix form, okay? So all of you should be able to do this. So how do I get? So I write this as B equal to E naught times CD minus D times CD, right? Or I can write the reverse manner. I can write this as D times C D minus E naught times C D equal to minus B. Again, it is a column equation. This is a matrix times a column minus a number times a column equal to a column. Is it okay? Note again, this is known. I am repeating, this is my B, which is just the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between doubly excited determinant Hartree Fock, and I will do that actually. I can use Slater rule and find it out. You know, that I have not done it yet, but that Slater rule can be trivially applied. I need to find out CD, okay? So what will I do? I will write this as D minus E naught, but 
But note that now I have a problem. This is a matrix. This is a number. So how do I multiply? I have to multiply this by a identity matrix. Correct? This is basically substitute subtracting from diagonal elements of D E naught. So how do you do this? You write this as E naught times identity matrix times a column C D equal to minus B. Okay? So I have a matrix times a column equal to another column, which is minus B. So now I should be able to get CD from here by inversion. Formally, I can in I can write an inversion of this matrix, multiply from the left. This will cancel. I will get CD. So okay, let me write this now. So all WX array, although I am writing for a CD, remember I am writing for all the configure all the amplitudes of WX array, right? So CD equal to minus B, sorry, minus D E naught inverse B. So CD is just negative of D minus E naught inverse. We do not need, we do not need, yes, you are right, we will see. Yes, that is where the iteration will come in, absolutely. Yeah, you have already got the point. We do not know E naught also, yeah. So, so, but let me write CD formally in this manner and then write the correlation energy. So, correlation energy is nothing but E naught minus E hat epoch. Let us define it in this manner, which is nothing but B dagger CD. So, I put this value of CD. So, I have very nicely got minus B dagger. D minus D minus E naught into identity inverse B. Just want to make sure that I put one bar and two bar right, you know, just for the time being. It does not matter as long as you understand, but for the time being, I want to be correct, you know, formally. So, this is what you get. Okay. So, your correlation energy is in some way dependent on this total energy. Okay. You can actually subtract the Hartree-Fock from both sides. I can write this in terms of correlation energy itself. Yeah. But or I can write the E naught, whatever, whichever way you want to do. So there, there is a there is a simple way to do is that when I write the E Hartree-Fock itself, you can write as E Hartree-Fock minus E Hartree-Fock. So you can make it zero and everywhere you will get correlation energy. So that is again a trivial thing, but uh, let me not worry about that right now. It depends on how I define B, C dagger, etc. So I can write this quantity in this manner. Now note this quantity very carefully. The D is a matrix element between the Hamiltonian of the Hamiltonian between two sets of W X R A determinants minus some E naught inverse and then you have one set of elements which is doubly excited and then B dagger or B, B dagger and this is B, psi CDT, right. So you have a B dagger and B. Compare with the MP2 energy. If you look at MP2 energy, there are exactly two such sets, B dagger and B. If you look at MP2 energy, what was MP2 energy? Psi hat trip of ABRS, ABRS into psi hat trip, right. So that was really B dagger B divided by some orbital energy. If that orbital energy happens to be this, some approximation of this, then I can get MP2 from here. Obviously, it is not. So only some approximation of this will actually give me orbital energy. So one of the approximations is basically to write D minus E naught. Remember, D is this whole Hamiltonian inverse. as simply the difference of the of the orbital energies of the one doubly excited to another doubly excited. So this is where approximation has to be made. So we will come back to this. So otherwise of course you will not get it. If you see it normally there is an iterative procedure required because I do not know. I can take out E Hartree-Fock. I can write this in terms of E correlation. 
and then I have to do an iterative procedure. So, no, first what you do, you start with e correlation equal to 0, okay, calculate this quantity, find out again e correlation, put back and keep doing, keep doing you will get uh, final value. Okay. So, that is a trivial way to do this that you can actually iterate and get a value of e naught, okay, depending on where we start from. So, you can start from e correlation as 0 and then you can keep iterating. Of course, during the iteration it is not very easy because every time you have to do this matrix inversion, which is also not a very easy thing to do, a matrix inversion of this kind where there is a Hamiltonian. So, this is where approximations have to be done, but formally this formally that is how this step will go. You have to just invert this matrix D matrix D minus E naught matrix. So, basically in this matrix simply on the diagonal term whenever there is ABRS, ABRS subtract E naught, okay. So, one simple way to approximate this is assume D to be diagonal, that is easy. What do you mean by D to be diagonal? It means any time ABRS and CDT are different, the elements are 0. So, all I have is a diagonal matrix where diagonal elements are psi ABRS, H psi ABRS and you, you subtract your E naught, subtract the total energy, okay. So, assume D to be diagonal under the diagonal approximation, I hope all of you can easily do this, right. You can actually invert this because it is a diagonal matrix. So, all you have to find out are the matrix elements between doubly excited determinant psi ABRS, H psi ABRS. So, you can use letter rule to calculate this. So, you have one particle term of all, all Hartree-Fock spin orbitals except AB, instead of that RS will be there and then there will be two particle term where again AB is, repla AB is replaced by RS. So, you can actually do this calculation quite, quite easily and this is not very difficult. So, this with this approximation it is very easy to diagonalize this matrix or iteratively diagonalize this matrix and this is something that was initially attempted as a first approximation of a DCI method that let us, let us do a trivial diagonalization. No, there is no bound, there is no bound except that your E naught, final E naught has an upper bound, upper bound to the exact energy. This is of course, I should call it not really E naught, but E naught tilde because this is not the exact E naught, remember. This is an approximate E naught where I have used DCI. So, this has a bound. So, only to that extent whatever results you get, get it will not go, but at, at every iteration there is no bound. The bound is, bound is only when you converge. So, you cannot say that the first iteration it will be greater than exact E naught. Second iteration also it is greater than exact E naught, that cannot be sure. So, so essentially if this is my exact E naught, okay, and these are my iteration, I start with iteration 1, let us say iteration 2, I, I cannot guarantee that it will converge like this. You understand? These are, these, these points are iterative value. It may so happen that it may go like this, like this, like this and eventually reach here, which is higher than E naught exact. So, this is let us say 0th iteration value, this is first iteration, I am just calc plotting E naught basically. So, this is my first iteration, this is second iteration, third iteration, let us assume that it has converged at fourth iteration. When it has converged, it must be greater than exact E naught because of the upper bound theorem. But I cannot guarantee that every iteration this will be greater than E naught and iteratively it will actually monotonically approach, that is not, uh, that I cannot guarantee, all right. So, so if you make a diagonal approximation, then of course this can be easily calculated D minus E naught inverse and you can then show further that if this D minus E naught inverse is simply the difference of the orbital energies of diagonal orbital energies. So, basically en energies of ABRS then this will actually give you mp2. I hope that you can see very easily because B dagger B is already mp2 numerator 
and then denominator this will is a diagonal approximation. So, it will simply come as, as a denominator epsilon a plus epsilon b minus epsilon r minus epsilon s will come. Actually, this will become epsilon r plus epsilon s minus epsilon a minus epsilon b, but this negative sign will, will change it to that, okay. So, you can actually get an MP2 and I will show the when I, I know when I write this full form next time, I will actually write the full form by Slater rule. I hope you, all of you can expand this by Slater rule. Then I will show what is the approximation which will give to MP2. So, what I want to tell you is that while there is an exact solution of DCI possible, we can make two approximations. One is a diagonal approximation of D minus E naught inverse. Then further approximation is to assume the value of the diagonal as only the orbital energy difference. Then what I get is an MP2 energy. So, so MP2 comes from DCI following two approximations. If I do an iterative solution, remember iterative solution, so first iteration itself. So, I have iterative solution. So, at the very first iteration, I make an approximation that D minus E naught 1 inverse, uh, 1 is diagonal. So, that is the first approximation. Okay, A and then you assume this diagonal as the difference of the orbital energy. Okay, orbital energies of these ABRs. Now, now they are only diagonal, so no CDTU is there. So, it is only ABRS on both sides and you can clearly see that with this you will get the, of course, when I say orbital energy difference, it is D minus E naught, not just D. D minus E naught will have orbital energy difference and then you can clearly see that I will get MP2. So, from the DCI, the process of DCI, very first iteration under some approximation gives MP2, which is very interesting to see that there is a connection between CI and perturbation, but quite clearly that value will have no upper bound. So, I have made already, it is a, first of all it is only first iteration. So, it is a first iteration, I am stopping at first iteration. Second is that I am making two approximations. The D minus E naught is diagonal, I am also assuming the diagonal as the difference of the orbital energies. So, obviously it is no longer C i. So, there is no upper bound in any case. Upper bound is as I, as I explained to you is only when you have converged, completely converged the D C i solution, right. So, this, this will actually give you an MP2. So, if you have an iterative solution, then you can recover MP2, MP2 energy with the following approximations and this is Im important to understand the, the difference of DCI and MP2. Of course, if I do SDCI, you will never get MP2 because MP2 does not have singly excited configuration. MP2 only has also doubly excited configuration. So, only with GCI you may be able to get, but not the exact DCI. An approximate DCI can give you MP2 energy and I think it is important to understand next, I think next class what we will do, we will actually try to exp expand this to see what approximation will give you that as a difference of the orbital energies, okay. No, I am not stopping, just to show you MP2. Of course, if you go ahead further, then the relation with MP2 will break down. I am not stopping, I am saying under what approximations can I recover MP2. <coughs> It is actually an iterative solution. So, to recover MP2, I have to stop at the first iteration itself. Because you can see if I go ahead, then of course, this will become much more complicated. You will have you will have a further term. So, you conti com uh, continue to build many more, uh, many more times uh, this, this coefficient. So, I have to actually substitute that coefficient here, okay. So, uh, so whatever coefficient I have got, I have to go and substitute there again. So, so that will actually give you third order, fourth order. In fact, you can also make a analysis, so higher order terms will start to get generated, but only from doubles because MP3 also has only doubles, MP4 has singles. I have not done this. So, these are something that I would like to do when I introduce diagrammatics. So, please remember that M perturbation theory is not over. I will come back to that when I introduce diagrammatics. But right now, without introducing diagrammatics, I am just saying that if I take a DCI, then you have a very simple way to recover MP2 energy under some approximations 
at the very first iteration you can recover MPP. If I do full, uh, full eigenvalue equation solution, then of course you lose it. You do not really see what the MP2 came and went, okay. Only when you iteratively solve, you, you can see the MP2 value, all right. So the details can be worked out, but I think the philosophically you should understand what we are trying to do because essentially this is the crux of the equation. This is the crux of the equation and this inversion is actually quite complicated, matrix inversion. So we have assumed a diagonal approximation and then we have assumed the diagonal as the diagonal values as the difference of energies and then only you can recover MP2, okay. All right, before I come back to MP2, uh, the, the further details on the DCI. Mm -hmm.